Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> One of the lessons that I have learned in my time as a barrister comes not from a judge or a textbook. It comes from a great French detective. <laughs> Inspector Clouseau. Many of you may be familiar with his work from the Pink Panther films. In one of those films, Inspector Clouseau walks in to a hotel reception. He asks the receptionist, do you have a room? He sees a dog next to the receptionist and he turns and says, does your dog bite? The receptionist says, no, my dog does not bite. So Inspector Clouseau bends down, he pats the dog on the head, nice doggy, at which point the dog jumps up and bites him. He turns to the receptionist and said, but I thought you said your dog does not bite. The receptionist said, that is not my dog. <laughs> the lesson is always challenge your assumptions. Today, I want to confront three particular assumptions that relate to the relationship between multinational corporations, the law and the environment, and certain reflections of mine in the course derived from my work. As was just mentioned, when one talks about multinationals and the environment, perhaps the incident that comes most vividly to mind is what happened in Bhopal, India. In 1984, on the night of 2nd of December, there was an explosion at the Union Carbide Pesticide Factory in Bhopal. 40 tons of poisonous methyl isocyanate leaked out of a storage plant and into the atmosphere. Blown by southeasterly winds, it drifted over the surrounding areas. People awoke coughing and spluttering. 3,000 people died. Ultimately, estimates say that at least 15,000 died. Tens of thousands were severely injured. There was massive litigation. There was an attempt to sue in America. After two years, the American court said, no, you've come to the wrong forum. You have to go back to India. Eventually, in 1989, a settlement was reached, $470 million. But then it took many years for any of that money actually to be paid to the victims. When it was, the payments amounted to just over $2,000 per death. The first criminal convictions only took place in 2010. Meanwhile, over 25 years later, the litigation is continuing, this time about contaminated groundwater. That, unfortunately, is just one of many examples. Others, but by no mean all, include the following. Ecuador. There have been massive claims against Texaco and Chevron relating to oil spillages, which are said to have caused cancer and birth defects. Very recently, an Ecuadorian court awarded an amount of $8.6 billion of damages award in that amount against Chevron, with the award to be increased to $18 billion if Chevron refused to apologize. The litigation is ongoing and there are particularly acrimonious disputes about the enforcement of that judgment. In Guyana, there was a claim against the Canadian mining company, Cambior, relating to the release of cyanide contaminated water into a mine. In Nigeria, there have been claims against Shell relating to leakage of oil, and in America, also relating to, to Shell's operations in Nigeria, there is a very important test case going on now, Kyobel, 
which relates to Shell's alleged complicity in extrajudicial killings of environmental activists related to the Ogoni tribe. In South Africa, there have been claims related to mine workers being exposed. One of the most important was that brought by Mr. Mackayi against Anglo Ashanti Gold. In that claim, after four and a half years, on the 3rd of March 2011, the South African Supreme Court upheld a key part of Mr. Mackayi's arguments. Eight days earlier, Mr. Mackayi had died. And I haven't even mentioned BP and Deepwater Horizon. The first assumption I want to explore is the question of why these accidents happen. The assumption that is commonly made is that these kinds of accidents happen because that is the inherent nature of corporations. In a way, it is the price to be paid for globalization. And I say that assumption comes from the various narratives that permeate our culture about the nature of multinational corporations. At one extreme, we have the Hollywood version of the argument, which has it that corporations are evil, that they spend their time tormenting activists, usually played by people like George Clooney, <laughs> and that when they finish tormenting George Clooney, they're so evil they then go to planets and torment thin blue aliens, as we learnt in Avatar. <laughs> More analytically, there is an argument that corporations are driven by their legal nature, although details vary across jurisdictions, broadly speaking, the duty of corporations and the duty of directors is to the shareholders, and is, 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 is to make profits. Indeed, as early as the, as the 18th century, an English judge went further. He said, essentially, that is, making profit is not just what a corporation does, it's what a corporation is. Otherwise, a corporation is simply an intangible creation. It has, in his words, no soul to be damned, no body to be kicked. In his powerful book and documentary, the Canadian law professor Joel Bakken asked, if a corporation was a human being, what kind of human being would it be? Irresponsible, lacking in empathy, manipulative, but superficially charming. He concluded if a corporation was a human being, it would be a psychopath. <laughs> At the other extreme, you have the stereotype that the corporation moves around the world benignly distributing and allocating resources in the most efficient way. One banker recently put the point even higher. He said of his bank that it does, in effect, not just Adam Smith's work. His bank, he said, does God's work. These views are not helpful because in, in, in my contention, they overlook the fundamental point about these accidents, which is when you look at how the claims are put, they are claims put in negligence. The claim essentially is that this corporation fell below the standards to be expected of a reasonable corporation. And once you see that, you then recognize other fundamental points. First, the accidents are not inherent or inevitable they are preventable, and indeed, are often and usually, in fact, are prevented. Secondly, it overlooks the key role of personal responsibility. Corporations act through directors and managers, and these accidents are preventable, providing that those directors and managers make the right choices, the right choices about risk, the right choices about cost-cutting, that point is particularly pertinent given the audience I'm addressing today at INSEAD. It is essential that we get the analysis right so we can get the solutions right, so that we can get the regulation right, so that we can get the ideas of corporate social responsibility right, and so that we have a proper relationship between activists and multinationals. 
Because if we turn away from each other, if we deal in stereotypes, then we turn away from the arguments and ultimately we turn away from the solutions. The second assumption I want to explore is the question of to whom are rights, or rather duties, owed? In the cases I've discussed, it seems pretty obvious. An oil spillage, the leaking of chemicals, the duties are owed to the human beings who live in and around the vicinity, the human beings, the living human beings who are harmed by these activities. But what about the rights of future generations? This is an issue that arises most acutely in the context of climate change. On the one hand, we have robust scientific evidence that says climate change is happening. It is caused by man-made CO2 emissions. Unless we do something about it, we, perhaps we do not, but future generations do face a threat, not just any threat, potentially an existential threat. The window of time we have to act is a short one. And to the extent they say there is uncertainty about the evidence, we must adopt the precautionary principle. Against that, others say, well, we still are not completely sure about this science. And given the massive economic sacrifices we would have to make, we're just not really sure about this. At one level, it's a moral argument, which is played out in the negotiations for climate change treaties, the attempts to, to agree by politicians. Kyoto is obviously the, the word that comes to mind. But as a lawyer, the point I want to explore, at least an idea I want to suggest is, if politicians won't act, if politicians fail to agree, then is it time for courts to step in? In other words, is the obligation to future generations of such importance that it is in some way a constitutional principle? Two recent developments are particularly striking. One was a decision of the Philippine Supreme Court in a case called Opposa. And in that case, the Philippine Supreme Court went further than any other. It was a case brought famously by a group of children. And they came to the Philippine Supreme Court and they were seeking to, to end certain timber licenses. They were saying that deforestation had had a terrible impact on the ecology of the country. And they said, we come before you court, not just on our own behalf, we come as children on behalf of future generations. Philosophers, lawyers, legal theorists would say, well, that's ridiculous. How can, you, how can future generations have rights? They don't exist. The Philippine Supreme Court disagreed. It, it expressly said that actually you can come before us on behalf of future generations. They do have enforceable legal rights. And very recently, in Ecuador and Bolivia, new laws have been introduced to introduce the idea that Nature, not man, but nature has rights, the right not to be polluted. And under that law, in Ecuador, most recently, a river, the river Via Camaba, brought a claim. It, the river, sued Ecuador, <laughs> arguing that Ecuador had polluted it and had thereby violated its rights. It was seeking to stop a road widening project. The Ecuadorian court agreed. It ordered the uh, project to be stopped. I should, I should add the river was acting through two human guardians. The river did not actually turn up <laughs> in court. Yeah. That would have been very messy. <laughs> but in the course of its judgment, the Ecuadorian court said that one of the ideas underlying this concept of nature's rights is the concept that we owe duties to future generations. I appreciate that this will be a very difficult idea to put before other courts. I'm not trying to be uh, unduly unrealistic. I appreciate indeed that the idea of a river suing a country can seem slightly ridiculous, slightly funny. My concern is that in about 50 years time, it may not seem as funny anymore. The third assumption relates to the question how do we enforce environmental law? When 
You go to law school, you learn, or you're told, or you assume that you enforce environmental law by complying with statutes, entering treaties, bringing cases. But in the course of my legal practice, I've learned that that's not actually true. Environmental law, in its rawest form, is a series of battles, and they are, they are fought by remarkable individuals, whom I, many of whom I've been privileged to meet and humbled to work with. This is a painting by Goya. It is called the 3rd of May, 1808, and it commemorates the uprising of the citizens of Madrid against Napoleon's soldiers. It hangs in the offices of a Colombian collective of lawyers whom I've worked with. When I first, or rather a copy hangs there. When, when I first worked with them, I asked, well, why do you have that? And they simply said, because it gives us comfort. The more I worked with them, the more I understood what they meant. You, the first thing you see is that there are armored plated doors that you have to get through to get into their offices. Then you see they have to travel around Bogota in an armored vehicle. You hear about the time that one of the female lawyers was sent a severed doll's head, smeared in red, uh, in red nail varnish. You hear about the time that when they went to court, their worry was not had they prepared the brief, the worry was where are the snipers that we, we've been told what will be waiting for us. And I've seen this pattern of extraordinary moral courage repeated across the world with other environmental lawyers and activists. The activists in India who face defamation suits and worst for suggesting that pesticides are harmful. The priest in Guatemala who is harassed, who faces spurious legal cases for trying to protect a group of sacred mountains. The lawyer on a case I'm working with who has had to seek asylum in the UK because she found herself on a paramilitary hit list, having represented victims who complained about oil, about pollution from an oil pipeline. Perhaps they have helped challenge the most fundamental assumption of all, and that is the assumption about what we are capable of doing when we choose to act. In conclusion, I would suggest this. Do not ask, does your dog bite? Ask, is that your dog? Challenge your assumptions. Thank you.